what does this supersonic jet bomber, this experimental research airplane, and these anti-aircraft missiles all have in common? Let's find out in a very special episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Mashat. What these three machines all have in common, I'll add an airliner for good measure, is they're all represented in model kits. We're going to talk about vintage box art, specifically how many different model companies made kits of the very same airplane in the early years of plastic modeling. Before we dive in and look at our uh, models in detail, I just uh, want to give you a quick reminder to please join our VIP mailing list. If you haven't signed up already, we have a free bi-monthly newsletter with new images and latest updates on the channel. And uh, there's a link in the title block, or you can use the QR code there on the screen. And now back to our program. We're going to talk about the same aircraft, but represented in so many different styles of box art. And let's start with the poster child, the B-58 Hustler, done in, I believe, the most number of kits of any uh, 20th century airplane. We'll get into this in more detail. By the way, as you look at this photo, uh, you'll notice the weapon pod or the pod underneath the fuselage looks smaller than what you might be uh, used to seeing. And that's because you're looking at the payload itself. That is encased in the larger pod, which serves as a fuel tank and is jettisoned before the airplane would reach its target. But the models of the B-58 were many. There was the Comet. And again, we're talking about the different types of box art. The Aurora B-58 Hustler, the markings are in the wrong place, but it's a, a very dynamic uh, rendering by Joe Catula. Uh, Ray Gadke doing the Airbrush uh, B-58 for Lindbergh. It's got some telephoto foreshortening in the nose there. Uh, Monogram's vertically oriented box with the operating weapon pod. And Ravel. Now, I've told the story before, uh, but if you're new to the channel, uh, let me share something with you. Take a look at this photo. Take a good look. This is a B-58 on the ramp. You'll notice on the right side, there's a large yellow structure. That's the boarding uh, system. It's a ladder and a platform. And under the right wing is um, a number of uh, ground crewmen who are servicing the airplane. You see the engine start hose, the power, uh, ground power uh, hooked up, and the fueling is also done under wing, which begs the question, if you look at this cover, what are these guys doing? How did that guy get up on the wing in the first place? And what's he putting the hose in? There's no, that's not where they fuel the airplane. But wait, there's more. Look at the pilot. He's getting in the cockpit. What's he standing on? Uh, this is the Lenwood reissue of the airplane in flight. This was uh, done a few years later as the Jet Command series. And uh, we're going to talk about different box art on the same kit. Here's the original Aurora uh, Joe Catula rendering. And then it was redone by Jack Lenwood, who did a number of uh, covers for Aurora, about a dozen. And then, uh, yet again, they took off the gear, put the airplane in flight uh, with the new Aurora logo years later. They got a lot of mileage out of that model. Uh, how about the these three uh, Century Series uh, jet fighters and interceptors? Let's take a look. Uh, you had the Ravel F-101 Voodoo, the Aurora F-101, one going up, one going down, and uh, honorable mention, the XF-88, which was the predecessor to the F-101, so we're going to include it here in the beautiful Lindbergh kit. Notice the uh, very strong use of primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. F-102 uh, by Ravel, the original uh, S kit, short tail. Uh, the Catula Aurora cover with the uh, uh, production version, taller tail, and I think one of the tightest renderings from Joe, really dynamic cover. And then one of my, I would put this on my top 10 cover list. This was one of my favorites from the time I first saw it at uh, Hobby Rama in New York, uh, my local hobby shop. It's a Strombecker F-102. I love the box art, the use of the blueprint background. There's just one little small detail. It's vacuform, and you open the box, and there's these sheets of plastic that you have to trim 
uh, into the shape of the airplane and put it together and deal with all the vacuform assembly uh, minutia. It's a little bit uh, more tedious than injection mold. And it's a flying model. It comes with a stick and a rubber band and you would launch it. And I just had visions of putting hours and hours of work into this thing and then having it wind up in the neighbor's tree next door or eaten by the neighbor's dog or something. And uh, it just wasn't a very appealing kit. It didn't sell very well, but one of my all-time favorite box tops. The F-104, two versions from Ravel. Uh, and I want to mention the pricing on some of these models back in the day. These are mid and late 1950s issues. And the original kit was 79 cents. Uh, the fighters then went up to 89 cents a little later on, but reissued with the Sidewinder missiles and a ground cart and a couple of crew figures, it was a 98 cent model. And then there was this, the Aurora F-104, and this was a series of 49 cent models, which were economical, affordable. You only needed a couple of weeks allowance, maybe a little uh, lawnmower money. And you had a model kit. The bad news is they were small. And so you could buy them easily and put them together, but it just didn't look like the bigger kits from Ravel and Monogram and Aurora. Uh, this was interesting. The Hawk 148 scale F-104, which was uh, chrome-plated, and it looked spectacular. You can see there on the inset the Luftwaffe uh, markings and the uh, yellow background. That's the chrome-plated uh, buildup. But you had to scrape the chrome plating off of every piece that you wanted to glue. So it... Uh, uh, There's a lot of exacto blades. Hopefully you didn't cut yourself. And it was uh, a little bit tedious putting it all together, but a uh, really good looking model. And you had your choice of Royal Canadian Air Force, Luftwaffe, or USAF. All right, here's the next plane, the X3 Stiletto from Douglas. Uh, represented uh, in an S kit from Ravel. And a really dynamic, uh, exciting cover from Lindbergh. This was the first... Uh, version of the airplane released in about 1953 as a plastic model. Never understood why the wings were blue. That was actually the stainless steel wing reflecting the dark blue sky. And no, the airplane never had a red nose cone. But again, primary colors, red, yellow, blue, had to have that kit. And it was big. Uh, the Ravel reissue with the uh, famous Lenwood hangar door ramp scene, which he used in a number of different covers. And uh, then there was a, a further reissue, and I'd like to share with you how uh, the cover artists would generate their images. How would that happen? They would either take pictures of the model itself, or in this case, we're going to use a photo of the X3 in NACA markings. That's the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, predecessor to NASA. So let's take this photo and flop it or turn it around like so. And then we're going to take off the markings and tilt it upward about like that. I'm going to add some length to the wings. And voila, your source material, as it's called, uh, for the uh, X3. Now, take a good look at uh, Lenwood's X3. It's, it's flying at Mach 12 or something. The leading edges of the wing are glowing red hot. And molten metal is melting off the wings from the speed as it enters the thermal thicket, as they used to call it. So this airplane is flat out flying. And then Jack would do what he always does best. He'd play a little trick on us. He's going to put in the chase planes. Now, before I show this to you, think in your mind, what would be chasing an airplane that's going this fast? Are you ready? Uh, no. F-86s? You got to be kidding me. But that was Jack's world. And so... Uh, there's the cover, and uh, had to buy it. Really exciting. But again, take a good look. Uh, you got to be kidding me. Let's uh, show you some Navy and Marine airplanes. Here's the F-8 Crusader, uh, first uh, release from Ravel. Uh, box scale was a little smaller than uh, the next two kits I'm going to show you. The uh, Aurora uh, kit was closer to 148th. It had a removable tail section and a detailed engine. And they show that, to, this is interesting, they show that to you on the uh, box art, but the Lindbergh kit also had that same feature and they did not show it. So um, in terms of marketing, this was a, a nice looking cover and they uh, you know, talked about the Thompson Trophy and, and the speed records and all that, but it had uh, movable controls, removable fuselage and a detailed jet engine and afterburner, beautiful kit. And then the reissue from Ravel as the 2N version uh, equipped with Sidewinder missiles. And this is a famous artist series cover by George Akimoto, 
who was uh, the chief illustrator at Douglas Aircraft during my time there with the company. Speaking of Douglas, the F4D Skyrate is the XF4D prototype in white with red trim. And there's the Ray Gadke uh, Lindbergh cover, one of his, uh, I think one of his best, very dynamic. But uh, have you ever seen this? This is the original Hawk hit. Uh, we called it the Pizza Box. And um, uh, interesting, but the name of the manufacturer isn't on there. You don't see the Hawk logo until they reissued it as this. And then we have the Aurora, and I believe that's a Lenwood. As I said, he did a number of uh, covers for Aurora, and then the Comet hit. Interesting uh, juxtaposition of artistic styles. Let's look at some airliners. Uh, we're going to start with the uh, Sioux Aviation Caravelle, beautiful airplane, first uh, jet aircraft to have its engines mounted in the rear, which made the cabin extremely quiet. And the Heller uh, kit from France. And this is a Caravelle 3, by the way. The Caravelle 3 had the avionics tunnel of, on the rear fuselage uh, up there, extending from the dorsal fin on the, uh, on the tail. And the uh, original Comet uh, nose section. It was built under license from de Havilland, and it's the same nose as the British uh, Comet. Uh, here's the Ravel kit, one of my favorites, and a uh, beautiful model, 1-100 scale, actually. And then the Airfix, 144th scale, and this is where it gets a little tricky because it shows you a United airplane, and it's a three on the cover, but the United airplane was a six, had different windshield, no avionics tunnel, uh, slightly different engine cells with uh, thrust reversers. And so um, that started the truth in advertising issue where, where you weren't getting the actual airplane, even though you're building the model shown on the box top. And uh, another United airliner, the DC-8. United was the launch customer for the airplane. And there's Ravel's beautiful uh, kit. Lindbergh had a nice version. It was smaller don't know the exact scale. I think it was box size, but uh, this airplane had maybe an 8-inch wingspan. Uh, the Ravel kit was closer to 10, 12-inch wingspan. Um, you notice the see-through box, as they called it. It was a cellophane uh, window that you could see all the parts and everything. And uh, here's the Aurora uh, DC-8, and this is one of their best airliner models ever. Now, you notice that airliners come in different airline markings and Ravel had an interesting philosophy. If you sent 10 cents uh, and an end panel from the kit, I believe, but you would get your choice of airline markings for an individual model. Uh, I did this on the Caravel. It was shown as SAS, uh, but I sent away for Swiss Air decals and built that. So it was really an interesting option and it took maybe a couple of weeks to get it in the mail and uh, you had a very unique looking model. But in the case of the Aurora DC-8, they just made separate kits with each airline marking. So you had Eastern and United. I showed you the Delta. And then there was TCA, TransCanada, and Pan Am. And that used a photo of a test airplane. If you look carefully at the wingtips, you see the uh, data probes on there for the test program. And that's over Catalina Island here in California. Ah, yes, the Ferry Rotodyne. Another favorite. A uh, unique one-of-a-kind airplane. It only uh, advanced to the prototype stage, but this was the uh, concept for a city point to city point uh, helicopter airplane hybrid high-speed uh, transport. Uh, it never went into production. Uh, but here's the frog uh, representation, and uh, there's something just I it's so this box art is so delightful to look at. It, it almost reads like a children's story. That people are taking a trip, and the crew is out there looking at their checklists and everybody's happy it's just a very uh, lovely uh, feel to the to the artwork a use of pastel colors and uh, just a delightful rendition of the of the airplane which isn't quite to scale but uh, it's okay it's a really uh, beautiful illustration in its own right now look at this version this is the original airfix issue and uh, i can't quite tell if that's a map or i guess clouds on the left side but a very dynamic use of color and contrast, really effective cover. And then the uh, King of the Hill here with the Jack Lenwood uh, illustration on Ravel's box top. And Ravel was going through a wrenching change with their uh, box art and, and, you know, box design in the early 60s. I believe it was a 1961 issue. 
and you've got the cutaway at the bottom and a totally different style of art going in the opposite direction of the the, the uh, illustration and the look with the arrow and yeah, yeah we get it we know but uh it had a different style than when you just saw the entire box covered with the beautiful artwork like this and this was one of what uh, Len would call his Europe Euro wet series he did a number of covers with uh, a rainy ramp and reflections and uh, the lighting as you see here but uh, I'd put this one on my top 10 list uh, and then I'm going to wrap up with missiles. I thought you'd enjoy seeing some missile kits. Uh, the Regulus II was uh, quite an interesting concept. It was a uh, really one of the first cruise, long-range cruise missiles, which would have been launched from uh, submarines or surface ships. It was a Mach 2 aircraft. And then uh, you had the Aurora and Comet versions. Uh, I don't believe it was ever painted red and white, but it got your attention. And then the monogram kit was just fantastic. It was molded in four different colors. You got the blue on top, the white on the bottom, black uh, tires and details, and yellow on the ground transporter. And it was a really stunning kit. And then there was Ravel. And here we are back with Lenwood and his little bag of tricks. Uh, look at the airplane taking off and then... Wait a minute, it's got the gust lock or anti-retracting ground safety wires on the gear. So I guess this flight's going to be flowing gear down. But uh, again, one of, one of the most effective covers uh, of all. And then we get to the Nike Hercules, a Douglas uh, uh, surface-to-air uh, deterrent missile uh, with a nuclear warhead, no less. Uh, really the backbone of the Cold War uh, air defense system in the U.S. and in Europe. And we had kits from Aurora, KMT, which was Kusan model kits. And this was a Mongo model. It was 21 inches long. So how, how long is that? Well, um, it's, it's a large kit. Who's this guy holding his uh, KMT missile that he used for a uh, school project showing uh, uh, multi-stage rockets? I bet someday he probably grew up and had a YouTube channel. Eesh. And then there was the Nike Hercules kit. And this was one of the best missile kits ever, one of Ravel's best. And um, you notice the, <laughs> the, the CO yelling at the guys to get off the launcher because they're going to fire it. The biblical rays of light on the city in the distance. And uh, little did we realize that uh, had a scene like this ever taken place, it wasn't going to be a, a happy ending. But uh, here's a buildup of that kit. And uh, it... Uh, had an articulating scissors uh, hydraulic arm uh, launcher that raised up into position, and it was just a really beautiful model. Now, I want you to take a look at this list of World War II airplanes. It's all the great legends, the classics. And what do they all have in common? Well, during the 1950s, and again, I'm being specific, in the 1950s, not one of these legendary airplanes was built by Ravel. Those kids came along in uh, the 1960s and up into the 1970s. And this, of course, included uh, the Memphis Bell, which was uh, probably the most popular box art of all time from Jack Lenwood, and uh, the big 132nd scale fighters, which were just delicious models to build. They were large enough to really get into a lot of detail. And um, uh, it was a new paradigm for Ravel models. So there you have it, a look at box art and how many different uh, companies would do the same airplane and their versions of it in the illustrations on the box. Special thanks to the wonderful folks that helped make these presentations possible and a shout out to my Hobby Rama store there on Sunrise Highway in Rockville Center, New York. Uh, wouldn't uh, be doing this today without that store. And uh, a special thanks to my dear friend Max of Max's Models, the best channel on YouTube. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machette. I uh, hope you enjoy these uh, programs. We certainly do enjoy bringing them to you. Lots more planned in the uh, weeks and months ahead. And as always, until next time, take care. <laughs>